Hi everybody, my name is John and I'm a science presenter with the Ontario Science Centre and welcome to my kitchen! So today for our science at home experiment, we're going to be talking about ecosystems, simulating what happens when humans have an effect on ecosystems by modeling a oil spill. And we'll be experimenting how to clean it up. Before we simulate an ecological problem, let's look at what a healthy ecosystem looks like. An ecosystem is all the biotic or living and abiotic or non-living factors in the environment. In an aquatic ecosystem, biotic factors might include animals, plants, or even microorganisms like bacteria. While abiotic factors might include things like water or sunlight, the air, or even the temperature. All these factors are interrelated. That means a change in one factor might have an effect on the entire ecosystem. Now, if an ecosystem is able to support a variety of living things and work well over a long period of time, we call this a sustainable ecosystem. Think about some ways that we can tell if an ecosystem is sustainable. But how many living things can an ecosystem really support? We can determine a carrying capacity. Now the carrying capacity is the maximum amount of individuals of a population of, let's say, seals that a ecosystem can support given the available resources. A sustainable ecosystem is what we're going to call an equilibrium. You can see that it's generally balanced, even if I add some populations to both sides. The ecosystem doesn't go up ridiculously out of balance. However, changes in the ecosystem can affect it in the both the short and long term. Now, some of these changes are natural, like a volcanic eruption or a tornado, but all other changes are the result of human activity. Humans have a huge impact on the ecosystem. For example, we destroy habitats by clear cutting forests and we overfish our oceans. Now, we can also do things like pollution of our air, sea, and water, similar to an oil spill. And when that happens, the ecosystem goes way out of equilibrium. Let's model what happens during an oil spill. So here we have a tanker, and it's sailing through our model ocean. Now this tanker is going to represent our source of contamination. Now this would be similar to how in the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, the source of contamination was an oil drilling rig that had an explosion which caused 4 million barrels of oil to be dumped into the Gulf of Mexico. The transport of oil from the source of production to where it's going to get consumed is what poses the greatest risk for an accidental oil spill. Now we should also note here that oil spills don't always happen in the ocean. Pipelines, for example, which can be used to bring oil from, let's say, Alberta's oil sands to the coast, have the potential to leak up oil into the environment. Now this actually happened in 2019, where an oil pipeline in northern Alberta accidentally leaked over 40,000 liters of oil emulsions into the North Saskatchewan River near Edmonton. After the oil spill, we saw the oil floating on top of the surface of water. Now as you might know, oil and water don't mix. Oil is less dense than water, meaning it will float on top. Now, the molecules of oil are also what we call hydrophobic. Now, that literally means they're water-hating, or they have a fear of water. As you can see, the oil and water aren't really mixing. Now, in an oil spill, we would call this an oil slick, considering that most of the oil stays nice and slick on top of the water. So here's your challenge. Imagine an oil tanker spilled much of its contents while sailing off the coast of Canada. And we're enlisting your help to figure out What's the best way to both contain and clean up the oil spill? Now, we're gonna do some basic testing and create a model of what it's gonna look like. So here I have a model ocean. It's just a big dish pan. Uh, and I filled it with about a liter and a half of water to fill it up. The next part is I'm gonna measure out some oil. So in this case, I'm just using some cooking oil, but you can use really any oil that you have lying around your house. And I'm gonna measure in my rusty measuring cup, about 100 mils. That's the amount I'm going to put into the environment. Now keep that value recorded because at the end we're going to measure how much oil we're going to take out of the ocean. Ergo, how well did we clean up? So we're just going to add some oil to our ocean and we're going to notice that it creates a really nice oil slick. 
Now it's your job to figure out a way to get that oil out. Now this is going to involve some critical thinking and analytical skills and consider doing a little bit of research to figure out some methods that people use in real life to clean up oil spills. Now check for a list to see uh, what are some possible materials that you might use. Try pausing the video here to see if you're able to do this experiment on your own. So hopefully by now you've had a chance to try to experiment to clean up the oil spill. Were you able to recover any oil? Did you create a new apparatus? Did some materials work better than others? Or did the oil just disperse into the ecosystem? In reality, there are actually many different solutions to try to clean up an oil spill. All have varying degrees of, su of success. Some work better than others. It really depends on the situation. In certain scenarios with certain conditions, I might use one method while in a different oil spill, I might use another. There is no one solution that works every time and different conditions might favor one method over the other. For example, we can set up physical barriers called booms to keep the oil from spreading and then run skimmers across the oil slick. Now for a small oil spill, this might be all we need, but physically removing oil is a lot harder if the oil spill is very large. And if there are waves and winds to contest with, it can be really rough. These abiotic factors might even move the oil closer to the shore, which is definitely not what we want. Now, in other cases, we might use in situ burning, which is literally burning the oil off the surface of the water. Now, while this removes a lot of oil quickly, it leaves behind residue that sinks to the ocean floor and can affect uh, benthos, which are organisms like clams or mussels that live near the ocean floor. Another solution is to use dispersants. Now, a dispersant is a molecule that's similar to soap that will allow my oil and my water to mix a little bit more readily with each other. That will allow less oil to stay on top of the surface in the oil slick. Now, I'll see that in action. So I got my water, I'm gonna add a little oil. Now, if I add some dish soap, let's see what happens when I try to mix them together. Now, you can see that my oil and my water were able to mix together. Now, this is a really similar to how a real dispersant works. Dispersants have one side that is hydrophilic, which means it likes water, and another side that is hydrophobic, which means it doesn't like water. Now, that hydrophilic end will interact with my water molecules, while my hydrophobic end will interact with my oil molecules, thus allowing them to mix together. By using dispersant, we can make the hydrocarbon molecules in the oil more available to microorganisms, such as the bacteria, a canivorax, Borkimensis. These bacteria are able to break down the oil into smaller hydrocarbons, which they're able to use for their own energetic requirements. Now using bacteria or other microorganisms to clean up pollutants in the environment is a process called bioremediation. Now that we saw how an oil spill can occur and how challenging it was to clean up, it poses the question, what are the effects on the ecosystem? Like why is an oil spill so bad for the environment and why can't I just add some dispersants and leave that cleanup to the bacteria? Well, after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill that I mentioned earlier, it is estimated that between 600 and 800,000 seabirds, such as pelicans, gulls, and loons, were killed as oil clumps in their feathers, preventing them from flying and keeping warm. This can affect the ecosystem as a whole because seabirds bring nutrients like nitrogen from the sea to the soil through their uh, poop. This helps plants, fungi, and microorganisms grow. Now, if we were to remove that sea those seabirds from the ecosystem, what other effects could it have? And what if we were to move another organism from an ecosystem, like sea otters, or salmon, or aquatic plants that might be also affected by an oil spill? How does just one species affect the entire ecosystem? Remember that in an ecosystem, all biotic and abiotic factors are all interconnected in a food web. Food webs represent the feeding relationships between all organisms in an ecosystem. When any change, either natural or due to human activity, is introduced into the ecosystem, it can affect both plants 
and animal species and their populations. Now this can cause a cascading effect across the entire food web. For example, oil that's leaked into an aquatic ecosystem can get into the fur of animals like sea otters. Now, this can affect the sea otter's ability to keep themselves warm. Now, sea otters prey on things like sea urchins. Now, sea urchins feed off the kelp forests that grow off the coast of North America. Without those sea otters in place, the population of the sea urchins can boom and over-harvest things like the kelp forests. This can affect many species that live or feed inside the kelp forests. Even though the only immediate observable effects of the oil spill may be on the sea otters, which can cause their populations to decline, this can have an effect all throughout the entire ecosystem, all the way down to the bottom where the plants are. Now, if the plants, like the giant kelp or eelgrass, is affected, this can have an effect on the entire ecosystem, which could lead to an entire ecosystem's collapse. Now, these effects show that animals like sea otters are what we call a keystone species. Keystone species can affect the population numbers and the health of the entire ecosystem, even though their numbers might be small. So, by affecting things like sea otters, we're affecting the entire ecosystem of the kelp forests. There's no denying that an oil spill is one of the most drastic and extreme changes that threatens the sustainability of an ecosystem. Cleaning up the oil spill is an extremely complicated task and there really is no clear solution. This means for the prevention of an oil spill it is extremely important. However, like I said, preventing oil, the spillage of oil or other toxic substances in the first place is the best method to preserving biodiversity and keep the food web intact. It's our responsibility to do what we can to safeguard the environment from damage as a result of human actions. In 2020, for example, the proposal of the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline was heavily protested by First Nations communities, such as the Wet'suwet'en. This pipeline would carry natural gas from Alberta's oil sands to the Pacific coast, traveling through the land of several communities of Indigenous peoples. One concern was the environmental impact that this pipeline could have on their land. This is a very valid concern that given just three years ago, the Keystone Pipeline, which runs from Alberta to Texas, leaked over 1.4 million liters of oil into North Dakota. Maybe the solution to oil spills is just reduce our reliance on oil and oil-based products in general by doing a few simple lifestyle changes, such as reducing your plastic consumption or driving less. That way, less oil needs to be extracted and transported, reducing the risk of oil spills. I think we all need to remember that all components in an ecosystem are interconnected, and that includes us.